behind me is our 2004 Land Rover Discovery 2. We've owned this truck for just about four months now. And when we first purchased this truck, we took it to a Land Rover shop that told us it needed over $8,000 in repairs. Now, we didn't really do any of these repairs. And today we're gonna find out whether or not this truck has been the biggest mistake the company has made or one of the best assets that TFL has ever purchased. We're gonna go ahead and take this for a nice long ride and talk about all of the costs and whether or not we regret buying this Discovery. But first, of course, we got about six inches of snow over the weekend, so I gotta scrape it all off. Now, if you're watching TFL for the first time, thank you. We really appreciate your viewership, first of all. And let me welcome you to our 2004 Land Rover Discovery Series 2. We purchased this Land Rover almost exactly four months ago today, much to your guys' criticisms. And I wanted to give you guys an update on how the vehicle's doing, how it's performing, what problems we've had, and just what a money pit it's been, if it's been one at all. Now, some background. We bought this vehicle for right around $5,000 in the beginning of July. And that $5,000 bought us a vehicle with a clean title, roughly 145,000 miles, and a bunch of upgrades already done. So first of all, this truck came with an upgraded front bumper. It's an ARB unit with a worn Xeon winch with a wireless controller. It also has a closed loop winch system so it's all very safe it's a very expensive setup it also came with a terra firma three inch lift kit and a set of larger than factory duratrac off-road tires we bought this truck with a roof rack with a set of fake max tracks installed and best of all an arb onboard air compressor in the rear so you get a lot for your money when you buy one of these old Land Rover Discoveries, but there's probably a reason behind that, which we will get to in a second. Now, when we purchased this vehicle, we knew it had a few problems. The brake pedal was exceptionally mushy. It leaked oil, and we didn't have any service history behind it. So not exactly ideal when you're buying a used vehicle, especially one as notorious for unreliability as these discoveries, which we soon found out because we brought this vehicle to a Land Rover specialist here in Denver, Colorado. And that Land Rover specialist did a safety check, went over the entire vehicle and found out that it needed over $8,000 worth of repairs. Some of the big items included the head gaskets, which these engines are notorious for blowing, a transfer case rebuild because it was leaking severely and a bunch of smaller odds and ends that this truck needed. Well, we obviously weren't gonna put over $8,000 into a truck that was worth five, so we made do with what we had. We had that specialist do a couple of little things. First off, the solenoid for the tailgate lock was broken, which meant we couldn't lock the tailgate with our key. We had him fix that. We also had him redo the rear brakes, which they found to be past due. All in all, we spent roughly $1,500 at that specialist, and we had a running and driving vehicle that we thought was gonna grenade itself within the first couple weeks. Well, it's been four months later, roughly three to 4,000 miles put on this vehicle, and here we are, still chugging along, just as happy as it was when we bought it. You can see clearly by the state of my hair that it is winter time here in Colorado, which is why I have hat hair, and we have a lot of snow up here in the mountains too. We got about six inches this past weekend. Now, after having that shop do the basic things I described about, we also went ahead and did some stuff on our own. Now, we put a rooftop tent on it, which was brought to us by Equipped Expedition Outfitters. It's an Easy On Jazz rooftop tent. We also went ahead and wired up a set of Hellas. Actually, the previous owner had done the wiring very well in his vehicle, but there were no lights installed, so we put on a set of cheap Hellas, which seemed fitting for a cheap overland vehicle. We also had to replace the front cowl, the plastic cowl area, which was worn out and cracked. We went ahead and replaced the rear bumper with a metal unit 
Now, fun fact, the metal unit, I think, was $400 at British Atlantic, and if you wanted a factory plastic one, it was like significantly more expensive, several hundred dollars more expensive, so we went ahead and upgraded that to a much beefier metal unit. Let's see, what else have we done? We put a high lift jack on the roof rack as well, and really, we've just enjoyed driving this vehicle. So with the major service items done, we probably have about $2,500 in additional repairs. So we're sitting at $7,500, $8,000 in terms of getting this vehicle on the road. That is not including, of course, the tent or the high lift jack or some of the other fun stuff that we have in this. Now, what is still broken on our Discovery? Well, as with most old British vehicles, there's kind of a laundry list of things we still have to do. Um, First and foremost, the reservoir for the squirty windshield fluid is cracked, so it only will fill about halfway before it starts leaking. The transfer case is still leaking. The engine is still leaking. The brakes feel pretty good, which is good. Um, the steering is a little bit loose. It's pretty solid. Everything that needs to work does work. Oh, except for one thing, which is kind of a shame. These old Land Rovers have a heated windshield. This one has it. It still has its original heated windshield and it's not functioning. So either something is wrong with the heating elements or the wiring that's going to the heated windshield. But other than that, it's pretty solid. So everything mechanical works, the engine runs strong. The head gaskets, although the shop said they really needed to be done, haven't proven to be an issue really at all. It has no problem maintaining coolant in the system. That's not a worry. It's not overheating. That's not really a worry. Additionally, the four-wheel drive system works. So these old Land Rovers have a permanent four-wheel drive system. Both high range and low range works, as does the center diff lock. Now, some key areas where these Land Rovers go bad often are the head gaskets. This is an aluminum engine, so aluminum block and aluminum heads, and they tend to go through head gaskets at an alarming rate especially once they begin to overheat, which they do frequently. Now, I know that a lot of you guys say that with regular maintenance, these head gasket issues can be addressed. You can fairly easily maintain these engines to a point where they're somewhat reliable, but very few owners do that over the course of these vehicles' lifetimes. And keep in mind that the newest Discovery 2s like this one are now 14 years old, and some of the older ones that date back to the late 90s are getting on 19, even 20 years old. So maintenance is certainly gonna be a problem and these vehicles were legendary for their unreliability when they were new. Other common problems is a symptom called the Three Amigos. Now the Three Amigos is a failure of the traction control, ABS, and hill descent control system. It can be caused by a couple of things. Typically it's a wheel sensor that goes bad and it's called the Three Amigos because when one of them goes bad, it disables all three systems and you get these three dashboard lights. Now that's very common on these old Land Rovers. I have seen it twice during our four month ownership period and they both happened on the exact same stretch of dirt road in the exact same place. We've done quite a bit of off-roading in this truck. I've never seen it happen when I actually need it, but it's happened twice on this little tiny stretch of dirt road where we do our filming. So I don't know why that particular stretch causes it. Maybe it's the dust that gets caught up in the sensors, but it happens there. But really, it's only happened twice. I turn the truck off, turn it back on, and it goes away right away. In terms of the check engine light, I have gotten that twice as well. I ran our scan gauge to see what the code was, and it was a vacuum leak. I cleared both of those, and the check engine light will come on about once every six to seven weeks. It's always the same fault, that vacuum leak. I clear the code and it's good for another six to seven weeks. So once again, not gonna worry about that one so much. Let's see, what else is wrong with this truck? Well, when we purchased it, of course we had that cracked rear bumper and it was missing one of the reverse lights and in combination with that, the rear fog light. So we replaced that, but then it also turns out it was missing the innards to that assembly, so the bulbs and and a little bit of wiring, so we do have to still go ahead and order that. So while it looks like it's got both sets of reverse lights, only one of them is wired up and functioning. The interior is very sorted, so climate control works, AC works, it's a little bit weak, but it works 
fairly well. The heater works awesome. Um, heated seats work, our radio works, cruise control works. We have no warning lights on the dashboard. Horn works. Yep, that works as it should. The horn buttons do pop out every now and then, which is a pain in the butt. Transmission shifter works, all the windows work, minus one of them that's starting to get a little bit jammed up in its regulator, but it still goes up and down. The mode selector for the transmission works here. I think that's pretty much it. Even the sunroofs work, and this has been sitting out in the snowstorm all weekend. And, yep, not leaking, which is always good. Okay, you're gonna let me go, even though you're the right of way. That's funky. Okay, merging onto the highway. Not a ton of power. I'm not completely floored, but that's a good amount of throttle and it's kind of just slowly meandering on. So the engine in this truck is a 4.6 liter V8. It develops 217 horsepower, 300 pound feet of torque. When it was new, of course, this is the last in the line of engines known as the Rover V8, which means it's got a long history dating back to the early 1960s as a Buick engine, of course. It was updated throughout the years, and these engines were known, especially in this iteration, for being quite unreliable, if I'm being completely honest. Because it's an aluminum engine, it has a steel cylinder liner, and those tend to slip when the engine overheats. And one funny thing about the temperature gauge in these trucks is yes, it has a water temp gauge, but the way it works, as I understand it, is it reads normal right in the middle of its range, all the way from 180 to 240 degrees-ish, is where that gauge will remain constantly in the middle. Of course, by the time you reach 240 degrees, your engine is running way too hot, and it's not until you reach about 250 that the gauge actually reads warm. Of course, by this point, the engine is far too hot, and you're gonna run into some major catastrophic problems. Now, to prevent this, the previous owner installed a scan gauge, which lets us know what the temperature of the engine is at all times, and this engine, in this discovery operates right around 188 to 190 degrees when you're just driving around. The hottest I've seen it is going up a steep mountain pass at like 95 degrees in the summer. It reaches about 210, 215. So the engine we got here in the United States, either the 4 liter on the early Discovery 2s or the 4.6 liters were fairly underwhelming to say the least. Now abroad you could get something called the TV5, which was a turbo diesel five cylinder engine and apparently those were much better. The transmission in these trucks is good however. Here in the United States we only got one choice. It's a ZF four speed unit and as I understand it, it's pretty solid. It's nothing special, it's kind of a slush box but it does what it needs to do and a big off-roader like this doesn't really matter. Now Discovery 2s all have four wheel drive, they all have a low range and some of them have a diff lock in the transfer case which is funny because all Discovery 1s, which this vehicle is largely based on, have that center diff lock, but only some Discovery 2s because when they introduced the Discovery 2, Land Rover thought that their sophisticated traction control system was enough to do away with it, even though many of those early units still had the diff lock incorporated into the transfer case, there was no way to actuate it. Well, on some of the later trucks like this one, they did give you the option to turn on the diff lock, which is why these later facelifted models are more desirable. Now let's talk about the production run. They built Discovery 2s between the late 90s, right around 1998, all the way through 2004. In 2003, they were facelifted to match the design architecture of the newest Range Rover at that time. So the Freelander was facelifted as was Discovery, and then the Range Rover got the complete update to the LR322 from the P38. We are coming into our city portion of our drive here, and maybe this is a good time to demonstrate one of the best parts about Land Rover ownership, especially these older Land Rovers, is the seating position. And I don't know why no manufacturer can do it like Land Rover does it, but it's incredible because you sit so on top of this already high truck, you can just see everything. This old Land Rover Discovery 2 also has really thin pillars all around, so I've got an incredible view of the surrounding world, and with this lift and these bigger tires especially, along with this elevated seating position, I can see right over just about anyone in front of me. And that makes this a pleasure to drive around other vehicles in traffic. And in stop and go traffic, with only a four speed automatic, it's just not a 
very fuel efficient combination. And it's compounded by the fact that Land Rover recommends you use premium fuel. Yeah, when gas gets expensive, this thing is gonna be a nightmare. Now I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate from you Land Rover guys when I say this, but we don't put premium fuel into this old soot bomb. It's just, I, I, like you can't justify it. Um, I'm, I don't know how much longer this engine's gonna be with us to begin with, and I'm probably not helping the matter, but you know, we just run regular or maybe mid-grade if we're feeling generous. And here we are on a stretch of highway, and this is probably as good of time as any to talk about comfort, and that's probably one of my favorite parts about owning this old truck. Even with these very aggressive off-road tires on it, the truck is quiet at highway speeds. It surprisingly doesn't whistle with this Baja rack up there or the tent, which is very impressive. And keep in mind that this truck would have been very expensive when new. Land Rover Discoveries are premium vehicles. They always pretty much have been here in the United States and they most likely will be going forward as well. And this truck is no exception. You've got these big comfortable captain's chairs with these fully adjustable armrests. You have automatic climate control. You've got these suede inserts on the door panels. You've got a very soft headliner, which does start to sag admittedly. The dashboard is trimmed in wood and soft touch materials. And there's leather everywhere. And this steering wheel is nice and thick and wrapped in a high quality leather. The gear shift is leather. It's just a great place to spend time. It's a great place to road trip as well if you can deal with the fuel economy, which is rough. It is rough. Come on, truck full throttle. This is a passing test. There's 45, 50, 55. Don't explode, 60. 65. Yeah, it's not that quick. It does sort of pull up our skirt and start to shuffle along, but it's not G63 territory. And possibly the best part of this vehicle, of course, is the off-road ability. And that's really what sets Land Rover apart from the competition. We have solid axles front and rear, which is why I'm so amazed that this vehicle rides as well as it does because so many solid axle vehicles ride terribly. This is not at all like that. Solid axles means it articulates incredibly well off-road. We also have a body on frame construction, which means it's very stiff, very durable. With the low range and the traction control, it's got plenty of traction, plenty of torque to get you over just about anything. And best of all, there's a lot of clearance. I mean, it's just a high riding vehicle. The fact of the matter is, Land Rover has a long heritage of off-road ability. They've conquered Australia, they've conquered a lot of Africa, and there's a reason for it. You just feel very confident when you take one of these off-road. Let's talk about some of the rationale behind why we purchased this Land Rover, and we looked very closely at several other vehicles. We wanted an off-road project, a fun SUV to play around and tinker with, and we had many, many choices. We didn't want it to be too old because my dad, Roman, still needed this vehicle to take him to the airport. And we didn't want something that wasn't going to be that good off-road because we were going to use it as a chase vehicle, as a backup vehicle, because we had just gotten rid of the Raptor at the time and, and wanted something that we could use to tow other vehicles out of trouble if need be. So the primary contender we looked at was the Land Cruiser. And we really wanted a Land Cruiser. There were two we looked at. Um, the 60 series was too old. That was like the 1980s model. That was too old. Um, the 200 series is too new and too expensive. We wanted to spend between five and 10 grand. So we were looking at, you know, 80 series Land Cruisers, the 1990s, and then the 100 series, which would have competed directly with this Discovery. Now the 80 series Land Cruisers are a great choice. The straight six is still a little bit agricultural in those, and it's getting hard to find a good one. The 100 series Land Cruiser is more available in our area. But to be frank, if we wanted a 100 series Land Cruiser with a similar mileage, right around 140, 150,000 miles, and similar modifications, we'd be paying 15, 17 thousand dollars. I mean, they're just more expensive vehicles. And the reason is, is because of course, they're better made. 
a Land Cruiser with 150,000 miles, you're probably not going to have to worry about at all, to be frank. And a Land Rover with 150,000 miles is probably going to be a little bit of a service nightmare. A good 80 series Land Cruiser with similar mods to this is still probably going to be eight, ten, maybe fifteen thousand dollars now. The Land Rover was an obvious choice. Now, I really wanted a Land Rover Discovery One. Um, I've read that Discovery Ones are somewhat more reliable because there's less electronics to go wrong, but I, I just couldn't find a good Discovery One. We looked at one with low mileage, it had like 70,000 miles, with a check engine light on, and the guy wanted seven grand for it or something. Um, and then the higher mileage ones were just absolutely roached in our area. So my dad actually found this Discovery 2 on Craigslist. My dad had a neighbor who had one of these when I was younger and it was just garbage. So he's like, no Discovery 2, none at all, but he liked the mods, we took a look at it and it was the right one for us. Needless to say, I think though, at some point in TFL history, we're gonna own one, we just have to. I'd love to experience the legendary Land Cruiser. Um, what else do we look at? G-Wagons were awesome, I love G-Wagons, but they are way too expensive. Even a fairly roached early 2000s G-Wagon is still gonna run you $25,000, $30,000 here in the States. Let's see what else. Um, Grand Cherokees are okay. We, you know, we've owned a lot of Jeeps, so it's time to experience something new. Uh, we looked at Xterras, that was a very possible choice. We looked at Tourags, I actually think Volkswagen Tourags are really interesting. The first generations are incredibly good off-road and nobody knows it. So we looked at Tourags for a while, Cayenne, same thing. Um, but I don't know, they were just not quite rugged enough for what we needed. So we settled on this Land Rover Discovery 2. And it has been a blast. We have loved owning this vehicle. First off, it's been fairly bulletproof, really. We haven't had any catastrophic failures in the last 3,000 miles. But the fact of the matter is, with an old Land Rover, you have to expect these things. And we do expect these things. And we're just gonna stay up on the maintenance and fix things as they break. And that's kind of the attitude you have to take. Plus, you can fix a lot of stuff on a $5,000 Land Rover before you're up to the cost of a 2004 Land Cruiser with a similar mod. So a lot of stuff can break before we're in that $15,000 range. And like I said, with the mods we've done and the fixes we've had, we're probably sitting around eight grand. So what are our conclusions with the 2004 Land Rover? Well, we've really enjoyed the last few months owning and experiencing what Landy here has to offer. The whole driving experience, the seating position, the off-road capability, all makes this a very fun and exciting vehicle to live with. Having said that, I think this would be a terrible truck to drive on a daily basis. Between the fuel economy and the expense of maintenance and repairs, it just wouldn't make a lot of logical sense. But as a vehicle to take out on the weekends to go camping with, to go on light, small expeditions with your family with, this Discovery is just so much fun. It's like no other vehicle on the road. Once you have the Land Rover bug, you have it for life pretty much, as I understand it. And I completely understand why, because these old trucks are just addicting, and the Land Cruiser is pretty much a better vehicle in just about every way. But if you really want a Land Rover, there's just really no substitute because they're they're unlike just about any other vehicle on the road in both good and bad ways. Well guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video style. It's a little bit different than what we usually do, just trying something more casual, more long form. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Well, as always, I'm Tommy with the Fastlane Off-Road. Be sure to stay tuned for more Land Rover Off-Road videos we've got coming up soon. Wow, see you next time.